in the final section of chapter 22, we'll be talking about how to prepare financial budgets. There are two parts to the firm's cash budget, the sources of cash and the uses of cash. In order to prepare the sources of cash, we need to know the firm's projected sales revenue. We already have the expected sales revenue from January, February, and March from the firm's sales budget. And Miles Manufacturing expects that they will have sales revenue of $90,000 at the end of December of the previous year. In addition, we need to know the terms under which Miles sells its merchandise to its customers. In this case, Miles expects to sell all of its merchandise on credit. It wouldn't have to be that way if the firm expected that it had some cash sales. It could estimate that as well. That would simply mean that the cash from cash sales would arrive sooner. Miles expects that 75% of its account receivable will be collected in the same month in which the goods were sold. And it expects that 24% will be collected the following month. The remaining 1% is the firm's expected bad debt, sales for which no cash will be received. Let's make a budget for the sources of cash at Miles Manufacturing. In January, the firm has two sources of cash. It expects to receive the last bit of cash from the December sales and the first part of the cash from January sales. So the December sales were $90,000. The firm expects to have collected 75% of that amount in December. So in January, the firm expects to collect 24% of December's sales. In addition, Miles Manufacturing expects to sell $80,000 of merchandise in January and collect 75% of that amount. Altogether, the money collected in January for December sales plus the money collected in January for January sales equals the total amount of cash that Miles expects to collect from its customers in January. Now let's look at February. The firm expects to collect the other 24% of its January sales cash in February. And it expects to collect 75% of its February sales as cash in February. Add these two amounts together and the firm can see how much total cash receipts it expects to collect during February. Similarly, in March, the firm expects to collect the last 24% of February sales and 75% of March's sales. Add these two together and the firm can figure out its total expected cash receipts for March. Notice that the 1% bad debt 
simply doesn't appear in the cash budget because that is not cash that the firm ever expects to collect. Altogether, this cash receipts budget shows how much cash the firm can expect to get from its customers in the first three months of next year. These are probably the only sources of cash that the firm has unless it has some plan to sell a long-term asset like some machinery or an investment. Now let's look at the firm's expected uses for cash. Miles Manufacturing expects to pay 60% of its manufacturing costs, direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead in the same month in which those costs are incurred, and it expects to pay the rest the following month. Note that the firm didn't budget any bad debt expense in its payment of its obligations. Any firm that failed to pay one of its creditors would have trouble getting credit in the future from any of its other creditors. This firm expects to pay all of its operating expenses that is, its costs for selling and administrative, in the same month in which those costs are incurred. Another firm might have different assumptions for when it pays its operating expenses. Finally, the firm has $1,600 of monthly depreciation. This is a non-cash expense, so we have to remove that from the firm's uses of cash. This firm treats that depreciation as a non-cash operating expense. This table summarizes the expected manufacturing costs and operating expenses at Miles Manufacturing for the first part of the coming year. Under manufacturing costs, the information for December has to be given. That probably came from the firm's budget for the end of last year. The information for January, February, and March came from the direct materials direct labor, and manufacturing overhead budgets that we prepared in part two of this chapter. The information for the firm's operating expenses came from its selling and administrative budget that we prepared in part three of this chapter. Note that we don't need any information about December because this firm believes that it will pay all of its operating expenses in the same month when they are incurred. For January, February, and March, we take the total amount of selling and administrative expenses from the budget and subtract out the depreciation because it's a non cash expense. Here's a thought question. Which of these expenses would not appear in a cash budget? That's right. Depreciation expense is removed from the cash budget because it's a non-cash expense. Now let's determine how much cash the firm needs in January, February, and March of next year to pay its bills. The manufacturing costs come from 
the slide where we determine the total of the direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead in each month, and the operating expenses paid come from the same slide where we took each month's selling and administrative costs and subtracted out the non-cash depreciation. So how much will the firm expect to pay to run its operations in January? We were told that December's manufacturing costs were $52,000, and the firm expects to pay 60% of that in December. So in January, it would expect to pay the other 40%. In addition, we determined January's expected manufacturing costs, and the firm expects to pay 60% of that amount in January. If we add the December manufacturing costs paid in January and the January manufacturing costs paid in January, and the January operating expenses paid, that tells us the total expected use of cash to run the firm in January. Now let's look at February. The firm expects to pay the other 40% of January's manufacturing costs and 60% of February's manufacturing costs and 100% of the firm's cash operating expenses in February. And we can determine that total. Similarly, in March, the firm will pay the other 40% of February's manufacturing costs, 60% of March's manufacturing costs, and 100% of March's operating cash expenses. And we can find that total. Altogether, this cash use schedule shows how much cash the firm should expect to pay in the first three months of next year. The firm should also think about any other plans for spending cash. For example, the firm may plan capital expenditures like buying some machinery or a building or investing in stocks or bonds of other firms. A firm might also plan to redeem its bonds or to repurchase some of its own stock as treasury stock. Or the firm might plan to pay a cash dividend. In addition, we need to consider the firm's cash policy. That is, how much cash does the firm want to have on hand at the end of each period so that it doesn't have to worry about being unable to pay its bills as they come due. Overall, this kind of planning helps managers to decide whether they need to borrow and when would be a good time for major expenditures. Miles Manufacturing does have some plans to spend additional cash in the coming year. Miles plans to spend $50,000 to buy new equipment at the start of next year. This is considered an investing activity because it's a transaction 
in long-term assets. Miles also plans to pay its regular quarterly dividend of $5,000 and to retire $20,000 of bonds. These are financing activities. Every firm has a cash policy. That is how much money the firm wants to have in the bank so that it can pay its bills as they come due. Miles Manufacturing's cash policy is to have $30,000 in the bank at the end of each period. A firm can prepare its cash budget simply by listing all of its expected cash inflows and all of its expected cash outflows and then finding the difference. But another way to understand cash is to prepare a budgeted statement of cash flows. This method has the advantage of helping the firm to understand where it's getting its cash from and what it's using its cash for. Operating cash flows come from the firm's ordinary business operations, that is, cash in from customers and cash out to pay for regular business expenses. Investing cash flows are always transactions in long-term assets. Cash inflows would happen if a firm sells long-term assets and cash outflows occur when a firm buys long-term assets. Financing cash flows are always transactions in debt or equity. A firm gets cash inflows if it sells stock, or issues new bonds, and it has cash outflows if it buys back its own stock for treasury stock, redeems bonds, or pays dividends to its shareholders. Finally, the budgeted statement of cash flows shows the change in cash during the period, and then by adding in the cash balance at the beginning of the period allows the firm to estimate how much cash it should have at the end of the period. For Miles Manufacturing, the cash flows from operating activities include the cash inflows from customers, which we already figured out in the budgeted sources of cash. All we have to do is add up the total cash inflows from January, February, and March. The budgeted cash outflows include the cash payments to cover manufacturing costs and operating expenses during the period. We figured those out in the uses for cash. All we have to do is add the expected cash payments in January, February, and March to find the total cash outflows for operating activities. The total cash in from customers minus the total cash out to cover operating costs gives the firm its net cash flows from operating activities. Miles Manufacturing only has one investing activity this period, the purchase of some equipment for $50,000 cash. That is a cash outflow. Under financing activities, 
the firm expects to pay $5,000 of dividends and to redeem $20,000 of bonds. Add those up to find the total expected cash outflows for financing activities. Now we take the net cash flows from operating activities, subtract out the cash to buy the equipment, and subtract out the cash to pay the dividends and retire the bonds, and that tells us that the firm's cash is going to decrease by a little more than $1,000 during the period. If the firm follows its own cash policy, it should end the previous year with $30,000 in the bank. That amount immediately becomes the cash balance on January 1st of the following year. Therefore, the firm should end the first quarter of next year with almost $29,000 in cash. What can we learn from this budgeted statement of cash flows? If everything goes the way that the firm planned, then it wouldn't have its desired $30,000 cash balance at the end of March. This would happen because the firm plans to use a little more cash during the period than it expects to take in. This would be a good time to think about what the firm could do so that it has sufficient cash at the end of the period. Financing activities are expected to use $25,000. The firm probably doesn't want to reduce its regular cash dividend to its shareholders, but it might consider whether this would be a good time to issue some new bonds. The purchase of equipment is expected to cost $50,000. The firm might think whether this is a good time to buy new equipment or it might consider whether it can finance part of the equipment's cost. Looking at the firm's operating activities, Miles Manufacturing expects to generate almost $74,000 more cash in from customers than it expects to use to run the business. So this is a healthy sign that the firm should have no trouble figuring out how to end the period with its desired cash balance. Now let's make a budgeted income statement for Miles Manufacturing. Sales revenue for the period is expected to be the sum of its January, February, and March expected sales. This information comes from the firm's sales budget. We already learned how to compute cost of goods sold in Chapter 16. So for the purposes of this example, we're going to assume that we already figured out the answer. Sales revenue minus cost of goods sold gives us the firm's budgeted gross profit. The firm's budgeted operating expenses come from the selling and administrative budget that we prepared in part three of this chapter. All we have to do is add the budgeted selling and administrative costs for January, February, and March. Budgeted gross profit minus budgeted operating expenses gives us the budgeted income 
before income taxes. Let's say that the firm has a 30% tax rate. We can multiply the budgeted income before taxes by 30% to determine the expected taxes for the period. Budgeted income before taxes minus the budgeted tax expense gives us the firm's budgeted net income for the period. But we're not quite done. Now the firm has to look at that net income and say to itself, if everything happens exactly the way we planned it, would we be happy to show this income statement to our superiors, to the board of directors, to shareholders, and to financial analysts and investors? If the firm is satisfied with this income statement, then the budgeting process is done. But if not, then managers have to think, what can they do to increase sales or decrease costs or increase productivity or some other strategy to make the future one that will support the firm's short-term and long-term goals. Here's a question. Budgeting makes it easier for managers to do all of these things except for what? Right. Budgeting actually creates slack because managers tend to underestimate the number of units that they think they can sell in the coming period and overestimate the costs of producing those units. A firm's five-year budget would be which kind of budget? Exactly. Five years is too far into the future to be able to make an operational budget, a master budget, or a flexible budget. In this chapter, we projected out three months. On the other hand, the firm should have some kind of a strategic plan for how it will achieve its long-term goals. That would be a strategic budget. This is the end of chapter 22.